Hello and welcome to a very exciting episode of Ozpol Explained where we have Simon Millman MLA with us. He has graciously allowed us to interview him about what he does as a state MP. So would you like to introduce yourself? Sure thing, David, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this um, wonderful educational experience. So, as you say, my name's Simon Millman. I'm the local member of state parliament for the state seat of Mount Lawley, a position to which I was elected by the people of Mount Lawley in 2017. For those of you listening at home but not watching, um, if you're visually impaired, I'm about six foot two, although I'm seated for the purposes of this interview. I have uh, very little hair and it's cropped very short and I wear... Um, dark rimmed glasses. So the bald guy, the tall bald guy with glasses is how I'm often described, hopefully also with a bit of a smile. So let's dive in. So how does the role of state government differ from that of federal? I'm going to give you a relatively lengthy answer, but it will be, um, it will be grounded in history so that there's a proper appreciation of, of precisely where the differences arise. The thing to remember about state government versus federal government is that state governments existed first. The state governments in all of the colonies as they, as they were then came together to form the Commonwealth of Australia. They gave certain designated powers to the federal parliament. Everything that's not numbered in the constitution that's one of those powers that was referred to the federal parliament is a, is a power that's reserved to the state parliament. And so uh, in the language uh, of politics and law, we like to say that the state parliament has, law, has the power to make laws with respect to peace, order, and good government. And this has been defined by cases over time as being a very wide plenary type power to deal with all sorts of different issues. That's probably the first and most important distinction. The second is that we are fortunate, members of the lower house, uh, the legislative assembly in the state parliament, are much closer to our constituents. We only represent about 25,000 people per electorate in contrast to our federal counterparts who represent about 100,000 people. And we meet in Perth rather than in Canberra. So there's, no, there's, not, there's not as much time away from home for us as well. So they're probably the, the main distinctions that I would highlight. You're a member of the Legislative Assembly. How does that chamber differ from the Legislative Council? Each chamber has um, important functions and responsibilities, and those functions and responsibilities shape how those chambers behave. The Legislative Assembly is where the Premier is. The Premier will always be a member of the Legislative Assembly. It's the chamber in which the government is formed, whereas the Legislative Council operates as a house of review. So legislation often, not always, but often um, is initiated in the Legislative Assembly by the government of the day, who have the numbers to control the legislative agenda and the work of the Parliament. So the legislation passes the Legislative Assembly and then moves up to the Legislative Council to be reviewed, amended, sent back or approved, and then sent through to the Governor for royal assent. The other way in which it differs uh, is the mechanism by which members are elected. So every member in the Legislative Assembly represents a single member district. So I represent the electorate of Mount Lawley and I'm the only person who represents Mount Lawley. For the purposes of the Legislative Council, the electorate of Mount Lawley is in the East Metropolitan Region and there are six members of the Legislative Council who are elected from the uh, East Metropolitan Region and um, they're responsible for an area that stretches essentially from Wanneroo Road out past Gijiganup. Um, and from as far north, I think, as uh, uh, Muche or even Chittering, uh, down as far south as Armidale. So a massive geographical area. Um, they're all elected on one ticket, and so they're elected uh, on a proportional representation basis. And so the single member district of the Legislative Assembly means that um, ordinarily one of the two major parties is successful because of the optional preferential voting, whereas the Legislative Council uh, provides for more minor parties to be elected because you don't have to achieve more than 50% of the two-party preferred vote in order to be successful in being elected. So that would be the, the main difference, I would say. Do you know if this is applicable to other states? With the exception of Queensland, which only has a single state chamber. Yeah, every, every other state apart from Queensland has a similar system. Sometimes there's a distinction in terms of uh, the timing of the elections. Uh, the timing of, and, and this, is, uh, this is the Australian example, in Western Australia when we go to an election all members of the Legislative Assembly and all members of the Legislative Council will be up for election. At the next uh, federal election, unless it's a double dissolution election, uh, all members of the House of Representatives, that's the lower house, 
but only half of the members of the Senate, the upper house, will be up for election. Now, um, with that distinction in mind, every other state has one of those two versions. That is a lower house um, that has uh, single member districts and an upper house that has multi-member districts selected on a proportional representation basis. Your viewers should pay particular attention to Tasmania, which is a unique case in terms of the, the voting systems that they use. So the Legislative Assembly and Council, would you say it's pretty synonymous with like the Senate and House of Representatives federally? Yes, in short, but no if you delve deeper. The way I look at it, the, the rules of procedure that govern the Legislative Assembly are very similar to the rules of procedure that govern the House of Representatives. And in fact, the rules of procedure that govern the House of Representatives and the Legislative Assembly are more similar, that is between two different uh, jurisdictions, those rules are more similar than the rules that govern between the Legislative Assembly in Western Australia and the Legislative Council in Western Australia. So there's a, there's a, there's a high degree of similarity between the Legislative Assembly and the House, and the House of Representatives. As, as regards the Senate and the Legislative Council, the reason I would say that they are distinct is because the Senate's, the, the boundaries of the districts from which people are elected to the Senate is set uh, in stone in the Constitution. It would be incredible for the way in which Senators to, would, were elected to be changed because Western Australia is a separate Senate electing entity. Whereas there have been numerous changes over time and there have been changes in other states around the, the, around the regions which are responsible for electing upper house members. The geographical nature of the region is not as important, I think, as the fact that it's a multi-member district which allows for proportional representation. With that distinction, they're largely analogous, I would say. So like functionally, like how the House of Representatives is the only one that can do appropriation bills, Yes, the, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a good example. So, so th those appropriations bills need to originate in the lower house. Sometimes there's a crossover in the duties between like a federal and state government. So, for example, health is yes. one of these things. How does that, how does that crossover work? There are probably two important basic elements, history and money. Historically, the state provides the services because it's close to the people. The, the state the state can be the, the state can be responsive that is the state government not the not the entity of the government but, but the western australian state government is close to the people so it can evaluate and assess and determine where uh, services needed to be delivered what's happened over time with the commonwealth constitution is um, decisions of the high court have led to an accrual of power for raising revenue to the commonwealth government and we've seen that with most recently the gst which is a Commonwealth revenue raising mechanism. The states don't have similar access to revenue raising mechanisms and so they need to rely on Commonwealth grants to supplement their budgets to deliver the services that everybody in Australia expects a government to provide. Good quality hospitals, good quality schools, safe roads. What are ways that the state can raise revenue different to how federal governments do? The way the federal government raises revenue is through things like corporate taxes, income taxes on your salary, and uh, the GST, goods and services tax. So they've got, a, they've got a very broad taxation base, which is very closely connected to economic activity. Revenue streams for the state government are much more limited. So we can raise revenue through royalties on mineral production, which is a significant um, source of revenue for the WA state government. We can raise revenue through land tax, and we can raise revenue through stamp duty, and we can raise revenue through payroll tax. So payroll tax is paid by employers on the payroll, on the salaries and wages that they pay to their employees. Um, stamp duty is paid uh, when um, a property transaction takes place as a proportion of the value of the property transaction. Uh, land tax is paid not on your primary residence, but on investment properties uh, calculated by reference to the value of your land. So a lot of our revenue is dependent upon um, economic activity in, in uh, property transactions, so people buying and selling houses, because that gives us access to land tax revenue and access to stamp duty revenue. So I should yeah. buy so, a house and fund a hospital. <laughs> yeah, buy a house, fund a hospital. Thank you very much. That would be exactly the right way to go. There are other ones around the, around the place, uh, fees and charges, levies and those sorts of things, but the um, it's fair to say that the state's capacity to act with unlimited power with respect to raising revenue has been significantly constrained by successive high court decisions going all the way back to about 1948. State 
also has a little bit of crossover with like the duties of local government, right? Yes. Like taking <laughs> care of roads, etc. How does how does that sort of intersection work in the division of duties? No pun intended. The intersection of roads. <laughs> so the way the way it works is interesting. The, the in simple terms, the delineation of responsibility is that the big roads are our responsibility, the state government's responsibility, and the small roads are the local council's responsibility. Having said that, it's a lot more complicated than that. You know, we've got um, one of the first things that um, we were able to get done uh, after I was elected in 2017, I'm pointing away from the camera, but <laughs> for those of you who have an idea of Mount Lawley, um, the intersection of Walcott Street and Beaufort Street. Now, uh, that intersection marks the boundary between two different state seats in the parliament and two different local government areas. And it was a notoriously bad intersection. And there were a lot of uh, people in the community who wanted to see a moratorium on right-hand turns at that intersection in order to make it safer for pedestrians to cross. To get that through, we needed the two local councils to agree. We needed the two representatives uh, in the state parliament to agree. And we needed the, the state government bureaucracy main roads to agree, and it was all done by way of, a, as I say, a moratorium in the first instance, so that there was an opportunity for people to step back from that if they weren't happy with the results of the trial. Um, so it's a good example of collaboration between the different levels of government and between different government entities at the same level. You know, it's one of the one of the aspects of being a local member of parliament is you need to develop relationships with a whole bunch of stakeholders and make sure that they're constructive and collaborative. Um, because there's a lot of sharing of uh, responsibility, sharing of executive power. So is a lot of your job interacting with other levels of government? No, but it is, it, is a, it is a part of it, definitely. One of the great things about this job is it gives you a bit of flexibility in how you, in how you want to do it. And, and so you've got different responsibilities. And so I would say that the first part of my job is to be an advocate for my local community. Right? And so if the local community comes to me and says, uh, we want a pedestrian crossing, a signalised pedestrian crossing on Beaufort Street, then that'll require me to deal with main roads, it'll require me to deal with the local council, the Minister for Transport, the Minister for Road Safety. And so you need to, you need to have the capacity, I think to do the job, you need to have the capacity to engage with people and persuade them. There are other aspects of the job that other people do differently to what I do. The member for Southern River, Terry Healy, a colleague of mine, He's extraordinary at building a rapport with his constituents. He was in his local paper the other day for a, um, a woman who lives in a retirement home down his way uh, for her 100th birthday, and he dressed up as Elvis and serenaded her. Now, that's not something that, that's not something that I could do, you know? So you recognise that there are different strokes for different folks. And, um, and it, but each of us, I think, reflects, uh, to a certain extent, the communities that we've been sent to Parliament to represent. So that's how I would summarise it, I think. Neat. Yeah, it works well. The system. I'm a great believer in the system. I think you know. I think um, parliamentary democracy is a really good system, but it, it it requires hard work by the people who are involved. Expanding on what uh, you do or what state parliament does, what do they do besides pass laws? So the first thing I would say is that we are an advocate for our community. So you've got to be you've got to be of your community and you've got to be in your community. And so you've got to know the issues and concerns that your constituents have. And they might have concerns as members of their family. They might they might be worried about the quality of education that their children are getting or they might be worried about the safety of their local roads or they might be concerned as members of a local association. So they might be members of a tennis club that's worried about um, its facilities, or they might be members of a local footy club that doesn't have girls' toilets. So you need to understand and appreciate the concerns of your local community. You then need to take those and you need to advocate on their behalf. The second thing I would say that you need to do is you need to represent your community, not just in parliament, but in society more generally. So as a mark of respect for the local schools, you'll attend the graduation in your capacity as the local member of parliament. You'll go to citizenship ceremonies, you'll go to the Rotary Clubs meeting, you know, you'll go and speak to people at the retirement home and you'll say, I respect what you're doing here and the fact that you are contributing to civil society. Um, the third thing that I find really interesting as a, as a member of parliament is you don't just pass laws, you also do what I would call essentially research projects. I'm a member of the Public Accounts Committee, which is a, a subcommittee of the Legislative Assembly. The Public Accounts Committee is responsible for looking at the way in which the state government spends money. 
And so after I was elected in 2017, the first inquiry we did was into all of the problems connected to the construction of the Perth Children's Hospital, you know, which was, a, there was a litany of problems. And so we were concerned that, um, that the state, the state government didn't have the capacity to manage a significant construction contract and that was costing the state money unduly or unnecessarily. And so, you know, you bring the skills and experience from your former life, from your pre-political life to that uh, environment and you, you know, for me, I was a lawyer, so I used to ask, you know, I used to interrogate the evidence that we were getting. I used to ask questions as though I was cross-examining the witnesses so that I would have as much access, sorry, access to as much information as was necessary in order to formulate the report. And I was happy that we did that. Another thing that I did was I was on the, um, the parliament established a joint select committee. That's a committee of both houses of parliament made up of cross-party members. Uh, to look into the end of life choices that people in Western Australia had and to look at whether or not there was the need for voluntary assisted dying legislation. And that committee, that committee existed for over a year. We interviewed um, uh, scores of witnesses, we received hundreds of submissions and we prepared a report to the parliament which became the basis for the government to then introduce legislation for voluntary assisted dying. So yeah, so there's a whole bunch of different things. It's a um, I like to say to people it's a great job because it has a whole, a whole array of skills uh, that you're called upon to use. And so it's a, it's a challenging job, but it's a rewarding job. Excellent. Yeah. Now people understand uh, the role and duties of state parliament a lot better. Do they have to enrol separately to vote for state elections? My answer to that is this. There's a WA Electoral Commission, which is responsible for, for um, overseeing the elections in Western Australia, and there's an Australian Electoral Commission responsible for overseeing the federal election or the Commonwealth election. They are two separate roles, but the administrative requirements have now been consolidated by those two organisations working collaboratively. So if you enrol, if you, if you fill out an enrolment form, but my understanding is that you'll be enrolled for both the federal election and for the state election as well. And it's important that people enrol. It's important that people enrol because, so I mentioned earlier that I'm a, I'm a big believer in parliamentary democracy, but parliamentary democracy is a reciprocal arrangement. They say as a lawyer that you can only act on your client's instructions. You can't, you, you need to have the instructions before you, before you act, before you take steps in the court. As an advocate for the community of Mount Lawley, I need to know what their issues and concerns are so I can raise, I can raise those issues at the level that I participate at the state parliament. I can raise their issues and concerns to the relevant ministers. Um, I only know those issues and concerns if they get in touch with me, or if at the very least they participate in the process by voting at the election. It's incredibly important that people vote because it sends a clear message to their elected representatives what, what issues they are concerned with, what their values are, what direction they want to see the state going in, who they want to see running the state. And so it's a, so there are great obligations, there are heavy burdens on members of parliament, but there are reciprocal obligations and responsibilities on citizens as well, which is why everyone should enrol and participate. Thank you so much for this interview. Dave, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate and congratulations to you for the you. project that you've embarked upon. I think it's a really useful contribution to the public discourse and I, um, I hope people like and subscribe to your YouTube channel. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for watching and as always like, comment, subscribe, share, etc, etc. Comment down below what you would like to learn about next and also there is a link in the description to my Patreon. Enjoy, and I will see you next time.